Okay. Thank you very much, Ingrid. And we've now arrived back at the East Coast, back in Fife. Um, although it's been great to hear about the other projects that are going on in other parts of the country from, from fellow enthusiasts. And I've really enjoyed this morning's inputs. As Ingrid said, my name's Joe, and I'm a community archaeology volunteer in Fife, working with the Living Lomans Landscape Partnership, of which we'll say a wee bit more in a short while. And although I'm the one who's up here talking this morning, um, I want to emphasise what a great team we've got going on, uh, team effort we've got going on in Fife, and a number of my colleagues are also here today, uh, and we have a stand outside, and if anyone's interested in picking up on some of the information I'm going to present, please feel free to, to talk to one of us and find out more about what we're doing. <clears throat> this morning I'm going to tell you about the partnership, I'm going to talk about our Big Dig project, I'm going to say a few words about a couple of other historic landscape projects, which are part of the partnership, and offer some personal reflections on my experience in learning as a volunteer. However, before I do that, there is a small matter that I have to get out of the way, and it's about a bet. And I want to win this bet, <clears throat> because there's a bottle of beer at stake. Um, some of you may be picking up a hint already, <clears throat> but here goes, and please bear with me. The hills are alive with the sound of music, with songs they have sung for a thousand years. And that's all I have to do, but thank you for the accompaniment. <laughs> the things you'll do for a beer, eh? <laughs> no. Here we go. Uh, moving on swiftly, here's yours truly up on Benarty Hill overlooking Loch Leven, where of course Mary, Queen of Scots, spent a wee while. And I'm standing beside a, a five foot long oblong stone which we've recorded, and it's very different in character to some of the other stones within the wall. For those of you who are not familiar with uh, parts of Fife lands, Fife's landscape, however, I'm going to be talking about a lot about the two Lomond Hills, East and West Lomond which are prominent in Fife's skyline. This is the view that you will see if you are coming down through Fife from the north, but they're also visible from Edinburgh and from across in the Lothians, and they are significant sentinels in the Fife landscape. Both hills have recorded Iron Age structures on and around them, and I'm going to say a bit more about East Lomond, which is the more pointy one, where we've been digging throughout this presentation. And here's a picture of East Lomond taken from above and from the north. And I've used this black and white photo from the CAMS website because I think it shows quite clearly and quite dramatically some of the features of the recorded Iron Age hill fort at the top of the hill. It's a 1,500 foot high hill which commands a fantastic 360 degree vista looking up and down the Fife coastline, across to Edinburgh and Arthur's Seat, around to the Ockles, you can make out the distinctive peak of Shehalian, round to the Southern Highlands, to Dundee, and you can tell that I'm used to pointing in this direction, round to St Andrews and down the Leven Valley. It's not hard to understand why a place like this was chosen as a significant Iron Age hill fort and continued to be used by the Southern Picts, a tribal grouping in this part of the world named the Veniconis in Ptolemy's Geographica of 115 AD. And this slide shows Oliver O'Grady. You've been mentioned already, Oliver. That's another mention this morning. And he's examining something which is handed over by one of the school groups who joined us up on the hill. But it also gives you some sense of the dig location on the shoulder of the hill. The Firth of Forth and the Fife coastline and the new town of Glenrothes is overlooked by this shoulder of the hill. I like that juxtaposition. The notion that we have a settlement which was alive, inhabited and was working 2,500 years ago, ago overlooking one of Scotland's five new towns, which has only been in existence since 1947. And it says something about the continuity and the use of the landscape. The area covered by the Living Lomans Landscape Partnership is shown in this slide. And you can see this is an area rich in archeological sites. There are over 1,000. I can tell you that so far in our first year, and this is a three-year project, the team and the volunteers have recorded and GPSed a further 120 additions to the record, which is both pleasing and exciting for everyone who's involved. 
So who and what makes up the partnership? You can see here a mix of national, regional and local groups, including the local authority, which is the third largest in Scotland, two of the major trusts in Fife and the Falkland Centre for Stewardship, all of whom play a significant role in the work that's underway. But part of the strength of the partnership is the active participation and drive of the local groups, which means that the big vision defined by the partnership is connected to the people and the groups in our communities who are engaged and are focused on local projects in their areas. Another feature which you'll pick up looking at this slide is the solid connection between Fife and Perth and Kinross. The connected landscapes and hills that we've been looking at are no respecters of modern local authority boundaries. This slide simply states the principal aim of the partnership and the evidence to date is that we're making good progress in this regard. And this is where we are focusing our efforts. The regional park, Bishop's Hill, Lohore Meadows Country Park and surrounding areas. And we're organised around five themes and under these five themes we have about 30 projects or activities underway since we kicked off in autumn 2013. And for the next few slides, I'm going to be focusing on some of the projects within the historic landscape theme. And I'm going to start with The Big Dig. The Big Dig 2014 was the culmination of months of work, which I'll talk about shortly. But it was essentially a supervised community excavation on the shoulder of East Lomond, just outside the identified hill fort, involving trained and enthusiastic volunteers. It took place over a period of weeks and incorporated a couple of open days. Though the dig was visited by people each day, as this hill is a popular walk and our site was not far from the beaten path. So here we are again, at least Lomond. I'll just read what we've got here. It's an iconic site in Central Fife. Multi-phase Iron Age and early medieval fort. Never been excavated, but listed in the inventory, 1933. And there have been various finds on the hills over the past 100 years. And one of these various finds is, he said, this. And this is a carved bull stone found by a farmer in a pile of stones which had fallen down the hillside. It's held to be Pictish, and the only other site in Scotland where stones carved with single bulls have been found are the six which were excavated at Burghead in Morrishire, which is a significant Pictish hill fort in the northeast. And we think that's tantalizing and it, it excites all of us. But how did we define and how did we decide where we're going to dig? Well. We started back in February, March with a significant number of systematic walk over surveys. We identified and recorded various features in the landscape. And at the same time, we also began to find and collate a large number of boundary stones within the Falkland estate. Most, many of them were lost and not recorded, but they're identifiable by the letters WR and the date 1818. The initials stand for William Ray, who was the King's commissioner, who in 1818, was responsible for marking out the comity of the Lomans of Falkland, and that was following an act of parliament in 1815. The chap down at the bottom left-hand corner is Professor David Munro from Kinross Heritage, an internationally acclaimed geographer, and we're very fortunate to have David's expertise within the partnership project as well. There's a lot that a lot of us are learning. We also undertook a number of geophysics uh, training days at sites in the landscape, which were of interest. And you can see that uh, on some days we were well wrapped up, and that was normal. And uh, other days, a far fewer number of days, were t-shirt days. And that's very typical, I suspect, of people who are working in the Scottish landscape. We used resistivity, magnetometry, I've been practicing that word, magnetometry, and radar techniques on some of those sites of interest in order to further filter down possible dig sites. And here is where we finally decided to lay, locate the project's first big dig. And I don't want to say, but it's the blue bit there. This is not some alien landing site in Fife. That's just off, there's a trig point just beyond it, but it's just beyond what we know is the, the hill fort. So it's the shoulder that looks out towards the coast, 
with Glenrothes and then Kirkcaldy between the summit and the Firth of Forth. And so to the dig itself. The first slide shows one of the significant early finds, a very robust Iron Age wall. It's around three foot thick, with large facing stones on either side, and filled in between with smaller stones and soil. And I can say, having been up this hill hundreds of times, just walking, and have been blown off my feet on several occasions because it gets very, very windy up there, thick walls like this would certainly have been effective in ancient times in protecting anyone from the worst elements of the weather. The next slide is interesting, and there are a few points to note here. Firstly, the substantial wall of the previous slide. Oh, oh dear, that was a mistake. Uh, here we go. Now, how do you press that? Ah, the previous wall here. Suddenly, it doesn't exist. It has simply been cut off. And we see a later wall here, thinner, with a slightly different alignment from the original one. And coming into the foreground here, we see evidence of small-scale metal working on this site, which is pretty typical. And what we've uncovered here, this bit of um, material that you see, is a cup-shaped piece of slag. You pick it up, and it's actually pretty heavy in your hand. So we're looking here at the presence of a kiln on the edge outside the hill fort. And just beyond the later wall, get this right here, this feature here, you'll make out some larger stones in a box shape, which intrigued us all for a few days. And the next, side, next slide simply adds to the intrigue. Here it is here. We took a section across the box shape and uncovered the number of colored stones placed within this feature. Red, yellow, orange, pink, blue, gray stones. And this is something we don't yet understand the significance of. But the soil samples from this box have been sent to the lab uh, for analysis, and I can say, because Oliver and I were sitting doing this together, when these stones were excavated, when we took the soil away, the vivid colours were really striking, having been digging on a fairly grey landscape, suddenly to get this colour was quite amazing and actually quite exciting. What else did we find? Well, here are some of the other finds from the site. Prehistoric pottery and tools, whetstones for sharpening blades, a spindle, which suggests that weaving uh, was taking place, and two parts of a jet bangle or armlet, which indicates that trading was taking place by these people on the hill fort. These were produced in Whitby Bay and later in York uh, in the Roman period from the third century until the Romans left. And one of the most interesting finds is this possible pinhead brooch, which has which has got a lot of accretion around it, but that's also been sent away. Uh, for analysis, and we'll be very interested to see what comes back from that. Finally, we have a whetstone, and I have a fondness for this artifact, as I, I uncovered both of these pieces about two feet apart and about 20 minutes apart. And um, for those who have been on digs, when you wonder, would this fit together? And you bring them together, and it's a perfect match as though it was broken yesterday. You can imagine how excited I felt when, when that happened. I'm going to say a few words about a couple of other projects which are currently live, Markinch Parish Church and Lochor Castle. Here is Markinch Parish Church, which sits on a hill in a village in Markinch, which is a small village just outside Glenrothes Newtown. And this has been the site of a project by the local heritage group over recent months. And what you're looking at here is one of the best preserved Norman towers in Scotland dating from the reign of David I in the early 12th century. A church has been recorded here or nearby here in documents from the 11th century, originally dedicated to St. Droston. But with the coming of the Anglo-Normans into the country, things changed, and with the gradual dominance of the Roman influence over the old Celtic church, in this particular case, the church of St. Droston was rededicated to St. John the Baptist by the Bishop of St. Andrews, in 1243. However, like many churches uh, at the time of the Reformation, the church was stripped out, walls were taken down, and stones were reused in the local neighborhood. 
The church has, has, the church has had some work done since then, of course, but hidden behind later reconstructions, the project team have recently uncovered two long, hidden 12th century arches from the Norman construction. And these are not inconsiderable structures. In fact, one of them we believe to be around 24 feet, about seven meters wide. And we also have uncovered over 300 masons mark on this. And it might, I don't want to say too much because I know that Bruce, who's one of the leaders in the project is here today, they're about to produce the report. But it is not uh, beyond the realms of possibility that Fife actually had three significant ecclesiastical buildings. The Abbey at, uh, at uh, Dunfermline, where you've got Robert the Bruce and the Malcolms and the Davids. And of course, at the other end of Fife in St. Andrews. And it is distinctly possible that the pilgrimage route to St. Andrews had another significant ecclesiastical building here as a stopover way for pilgrims en route. The story, I think, is yet to be written, but it's a very exciting project. And here is one of those... Fine, that's fine, Pierce, thank you. And here is one of those... Um, arches. And Bruce would be happy. Bruce is here today. I see him, I saw him coming in. There he is with his hand up over there. Bruce will be at the stall and will be happy to talk to anyone who might be interested in discussing any further aspects of this project. He also sent me this next slide. And I talked earlier about the plundering of the church's stonework at the time of the Reformation. Well, how about this being found in someone's garden nearby the church? Mark Kinch's very own little dragon. It's a wee bit weather-beaten, but I think it's cute. And the wings, the tail, and the head are still clearly apparent. I couldn't not use him today. And he probably sat... This, no, back again. Thing. You see this plinth at the top? So probably he was in a wall with something sitting on top. Possibly. That's a plot of speculation, but... Um, our wee dragon um, has caused much intrigue, and I think we're all pretty fond of him. Another project which is underway, and it's where some of us will be on Monday doing geophysics, is Lahore Castle, uh, which sits in uh, Lahore Meadows Country Park, a bit of a ruin here. It was originally called Inchgol Castle, and it was once described as one of the four strongest castles in Fife, and was occupied from around 1308. The Knightley family were the de Valances, an influential Anglo-Norman family in the affairs of both Fife and in Scotland. And it sat originally on a small island surrounded by a lake which was drained in the 18th century. Inchgall, incidentally, stands and translates as the island of strangers, which perhaps tells us something about how the locals perceived the incomers who had been settled there by King David. I'm coming to the end of the presentation and I offer a few personal reflections. It's been an opportunity to pursue an abiding uh, interest. And I'm speculating here when I'm looking at this audience, and I bet I'm not the only one who very rarely missed an episode of Time Team on a Sunday night. I'm seeing surroundings through new eyes. I can't walk past an old wall or a bit of landscape without looking at it. And the number of times my wife has said, keep your hands on the wheel. Um, if I had a penny for every time, I think I'd be a rich man. We are beginning, although there's lots of local projects, we are beginning to think about how we can bring people together, how we can share some of our knowledge and expertise in the projects that are uh, part of the partnership. Very clearly, it gives us a sense of our, our place in the historical thread, and that juxtaposition of a, a very old hill fort and a brand new town just a couple of miles away uh, gives us that. And of course, the more we dig, the more questions we ask, both literally and philosophically. Some contact details because I'm assuming that people will be able to access uh, this information. If you want to find out more about some of the projects we've got underway as part of the partnership, contact details will be available. And to finish off, I actually think that's quite a good metaphor yeah. with songs they have sung for a thousand years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.